My name is Darren Carlson. I came to Athens, Greece in 2012 with Training Leaders International with the intention of training migrant church leaders the Bible. Little did I know what was about to unfold in my own heart as these migrants began to teach me. God was at work in unexpected and remarkable ways, redeeming marginalized and oppressed people as they came through this great city. This led to hundreds of hours of research and interviews, eventually even moving my family here for a time, as I began to catch a small glimpse of the story God was weaving together in this great city. I'm now compelled to tell this story to you. The people you are about to meet are ordinary Christians, yet if we are willing to listen, they have a lot to teach us. So join me now as you hear the story, the story of Jesus in Athens. One million, five thousand, five hundred and four. Men, women, children. Traveling together or by themselves. Fleeing war, oppression, poverty, slavery. The Chancellor of Germany, Angela Merkel, said it was the largest humanitarian crisis since World War II. In 2015, 1,005,504 migrants entered Europe. We are living in an age of migration. Never before have so many people been on the move. Migration is as old as the Bible story. Adam and Eve were forced to migrate. Cain wandered. Abraham migrated from Mesopotamia. Lot moved over a dispute over land. Jacob fled and returned. His sons moved to Egypt after sending Joseph there by force. We find fugitives, slaves, famine victims, and migrant workers. And that is just the first book of the Bible. Diaspora. A word describing the Jews beyond Israel, the exiled communities in Mesopotamia, Media, and Babylon. Centuries later, the Jewish diaspora provided the networks for the message of the resurrection of Jesus to spread, as Barnabas and Paul began their work at synagogues in the cities they visited. Today, new diasporas are forming, as people are pushed out of their home countries and pulled to Europe in search of a better life. And so they have come from Syria and Iraq and Iran and Afghanistan, Filipinos, Russians, Ghanaians, Nigerians, Eritreans. They have all come. Their goal is Sweden, Germany, Finland, or a host of other Western European countries that they have never visited, but believe hold their key to a better life. The access point for most is through Greece, with its 16,000 kilometers of coastline, the most in Europe, more even than China's. Its proximity to Turkey, which is just kilometers from multiple Greek islands, make it a popular route of travel. On their journey, something quite unexpected has occurred. Religious conversions and revival have broken out, especially amongst Muslims fleeing their war-torn countries. From this great movement of people have sprung up ministries, refugee centers, and in some cases, established churches. 
The churches are not making Athens an orthodox city, but an evangelical and charismatic one. So join us as we meet the people who feed and clothe some of the most marginalized people in the world. Come and meet God's people who are, in the words of Peter, God's elect and sojourners. Gather with the chosen outcasts as they come out of darkness and into light. Witness the miraculous. See people who have never heard the name of Jesus confess him as Lord. Witness the love of Christians toward people who were told Christians would hate them. Watch churches spring into action, entertaining strangers, showing hospitality, learning to reject hatred and fear. This is the story of God gathering people and nations to himself in a crisis. It's sunrise on the island of Lesvos, a place mentioned in the ancient writings of Homer, where 90,000 Greeks now call home. Out in the distance, Turkey, across the Mytilene Strait, four miles of water separating the east from the west. Islam from Orthodoxy. In October of 2015, 4,500 people landed in Lesvos every day, coming to the shore on boats, pulling themselves to a new life. The silhouette of a ship and constant helicopters overhead remind us that this is a border. People still risk the journey, but many are greeted by Frontex, the European Border and Coast Guard Agency that returns them to Turkey. But if they're turned back, they will try again. The smugglers are persistent. At one point, they were making three million dollars a day. That's plenty of bribe money to go around. A friend of mine was here when the waves of people were crashing onto shore. What he remembers most is the sheer chaos of it all. Middle Easterners and Africans wringing themselves dry as they wondered what on earth to do next. In September of 2015, the image of Alan Kurdi, a three-year-old boy drowned and lying on a beach, shook the world. The crisis became a campaign issue in multiple countries. A picture speaks a thousand words, but in this case, it also raised millions of dollars. Alan wasn't the only one, a friend remembers pulling a drowned baby from the bottom of one of the rubber boats on the beach. But there are other stories too. Hope in the midst of difficulty and death. Picture a boat full of Muslims departing from Turkey. It's dark. No one has ever seen the sea before. One of the families is from Iraq, traveling with their small daughter. The water is rough, and she falls off. They can't find her anywhere, so they start shouting to God and the people in the boat, please, please help us find our daughter. But it is dark, and they cannot see her. Suddenly, she's on the other side of the boat, and they grab her and ask, what happened? Over and over, she says, a man in white walked on water. He grabbed my hand and put me in the boat. A man in white walked on water. He grabbed my hand and put me back in the boat. Meanwhile, a missionary is on shore and has made a fire for anyone who wants to join him. That day, he decides to use the story of Jesus walking on water as a way to share his faith with the arriving families. He has never done this before. And now here comes the Muslim family from Iraq, cold, wet, and warming themselves by the fire he has made for whoever will come. As they sit, he asks if he can share a story with them. And he begins to tell them of a storm, and a man who walks on water, and a follower who steps out onto the waves with him. 
But the family interjects, what do you mean? Who's this guy who walked on water? As he finishes, he looks up. And before him, the family is crying. They have a story of their own. Can you give us the book you are reading? We want to know the man who walks on water. New life, a man in white, a Bible given. A risen savior confessed as Lord of water and life. God moves in mysterious ways, his wonders to perform. He plants his footsteps in the sea and rides upon the storm. Just down the road is a graveyard of life jackets. There are no markers, just dirt roads. And with the help of Google Maps and a good driver, we find it. There lie rubber boats, lifeless motors, and life jackets. A sea of them. Each of them represents a story, a person, a child. Many are life jackets in name only. Filled with paper, they would have never floated if they had been needed. From the beach, it's a long trek to Moria, the main refugee camp on Lesvos. The sign says welcome, but the migrants feel otherwise. To them, this is prison. The camp is meant for 3,000 people, but today, 7,000 people are living here. The conditions are unsafe and unhealthy, but the refugees are trapped there until their case can be heard. Today, the port of Lesvos is empty, except for a kid trying to catch a fish with his father next to the docked British ship Valiant. Its mission, to deter migrants from crossing the border. It's hard to imagine, but this beautiful port town used to be a tent city filled with migrants. To reach Athens, migrants waited for money wired via Western Union to pay for the ticket to board the passenger boat. Athens, a city filled with old temples and tourists who come to visit the Parthenon where Athena was once worshipped. Selfie stick wielding tourists are everywhere, isolated from a crisis around them. You can find neighborhoods today that feel more like Pakistan. Hotels and parks and airports have been turned into refugee camps. The sex trade is alive and well, as Greeks and Europeans and migrants all come and take advantage of women trafficked and trapped. But there are also hints of the miraculous as well. Just down the road from the brothels, an Iranian man recently came to a Christian center, clearly upset. It was 6 a.m. and the Greek Christian who came to open the center did not know Farsi, but told him to come back in a few hours to speak to the Iranian pastor. The man didn't leave. Hours later, when the pastor arrived, he asked him what was wrong. This man had a story. A man in white came to me in a dream last night and said, follow me. The light was too much, but I asked him, who are you? He said, I am the Alpha and the Omega. No one comes to the Father except through me. Who is this man? The pastor pulled out a Bible and asked him if he knew what the book was. He did not. He told him it was a Bible, which the man said he had never seen. He then opened it and showed him the passages of scripture Jesus had spoken to him. After talking for a while, the man's entire complexion changed and he confessed Jesus as Lord. They gave him a Bible and told him to keep it secret because the Muslims would give him a hard time in the refugee camps. His reply, the God of my dream is more powerful than the Muslims in my camp. I will not hide. The center was opening to feed people, but he said he was not hungry and he left with the Bible in hand. And they thought that was the last time they would see that man. But an hour later, he brought 10 more Iranians. 
He had shared his testimony, and they all wanted Bibles. There are new temples too, signs of a globalized world, and the perfect place to find something familiar. Thus fortified, I head out to see a friend, unlike anyone I have ever met. Greece is known for their beautiful beaches, but today something extraordinary is happening there. Baptism, the celebration of new life. I have never met someone like Sahar. Her energy, boundless. Her joy and smile, infectious. People are just drawn to her. I once met her for coffee and her phone rang or buzzed with text messages the entire time, all from migrants. She received more calls in an hour than I do in a month. 18 years ago, she was a migrant herself, forced to flee Iran but today, like many times before, she is baptizing new believers with her husband Arno. Gathered in a circle, they sing in Farsi, share testimonies, recite gospel promises, and then head out into the Saronic Gulf to celebrate new life. It's a real privilege to be part of what God is doing. Um, God is preparing people um, all the way up from Afghan, Iran, and bringing them to Turkey where they have met some Christians, where they've heard the truth. They come into Greece, there they've been helped by, by certain uh, Christians. And then somehow God then let them end up in, in, in our family, local church family. And we get to share Christ with them and the gospel and uh, they believe. And that's, that's a wonderful thing to see. These new believers are all migrants who have arrived on smuggler boats with no intention of leaving Islam. But strange things can happen. Two women in the church came to know the Lord when a smuggler handed them a Bible and told them to pretend they were Christians in order to get asylum. Instead, the women read the Bible, and what the smuggler meant for evil, God turned for good. Another man asked to be left under the water for a long time. Why? He wants to symbolize that he has lived a life in darkness for such a long time, but he is ready to emerge into the light. I was born in a Muslim family, but not really fanatic Muslim. But I was uh, very interested about knowing what other people believe. So one day I was stopped at the, in Iran in the, on the street for the normal checkup uh, because I was not uh, covered completely and I had a makeup. And when they did the search on my bag, they found a Bible, fake Christian ID, and a book against Islam. So I was put in detention center, and then uh, I was bribed out by my dad, and then we immediately found a way to be able to get out of the country. We got a visa, and, and we actually flew into Athens. We ha had absolutely no money, and uh, we had to start from nothing. And so for a girl that was raised in a very rich environment with lots of money, it was very hard to cope with actually not having any. I couldn't handle uh, seeing my mom and dad in to that situation. Uh, looking at them um, for me was hard. So I tried to commit suicide to end my life and the first attempt uh, that I tried uh, to actually cut my wrist in the bathroom. My little cousin was behind the door knocking the door and I couldn't get myself uh, commit suicide in front of a two-year-old. I planned for the second attempt and the second attempt that my mom and dad and my cousins all would be outside of the house. And when I went uh, to do it, the phone rang and uh, I uh, didn't answer, went on an answering machine. It was a cousin from back home crying over the phone that somebody woke her up to call me if she wouldn't call, she would not hear my voice again. Hearing what she just said, I was shaking and trembling, answered the phone and cried. The next day after the event that I couldn't get myself commit suicide, I got on a bus 
and uh, so I could actually cry and not in front of my mom and dad. So in the bus I cried and cried and cried and shouted to the Lord, God I just wanted to know who you are and I wanted to know you. But instead I've lost everything and I don't know, I don't even know you yet. And uh, what do you want from my life? And can you let me at least kill myself? You're not even letting me to kill myself. And uh, I opened my eyes and I look up and there was a church and a cross at the church. And um, I don't know what happened, I stopped. I got off the bus, went towards the church. And, uh, and the whole thought in my mind is like, you're in a Greek country, you don't speak Greek. You won't be able to communicate, what are you doing? And, but I stepped in towards the church and there was a sign outside of the doors that says the service would be translated to the English. The church was closed that day, but she returned on Sunday and started attending regularly. It was the first Greek evangelical church, the first Protestant church in Greece, just steps away from Mars Hill. As I study the Bible, and I learn more about God's love and amazing grace and what Jesus has done for all of us and I couldn't find anything wrong. So I just decided that fine, I'll stay Muslim, they stay Christian. The following Sunday, there was a lady came sat next to us at the first church. So the lady started speaking to me and she asked me where I was from. And I told her that I was an uh, Iranian and she got excited because she had about 50 Iranian believers in her English class and she was searching for somebody who could help her with her English classes. So I decided to go check on her to prove her wrong. And she introduced me to all the believers that were part of her English class. I heard their testimonies, I heard about their journey, how they came to know the Lord. So the night when I went home, I had absolutely no excuse anymore, but it still was hard to make that decision of following the Lord because I wasn't going to go halfway. I either follow him full heartedly or I will not. In the night when I was sitting at home, I prayed and I asked God. I just said it honestly as I was uh, praying. God, it's hard to make the decision. Jesus, if you're real, help me to make the decision. I need your help. I don't know if I actually was sleeping or I was awake, I still don't know, but I uh, immediately saw a man walking into the room. My reaction was like, please don't come because I can't breathe, it's just heavy, heavy, I can't. You're holy and I'm sinner, do not come closer to me. And he just said, Sahar, I told you and I'll tell you again, I am the only way and the truth and the life and no one comes to the Father except through me. Her husband Arno is Dutch. He first heard of Sahar when reading an email forwarded to him from his dad, who had received it from another forward. It was Sahar's first support letter. When Arno contacted Sahar through email, she assumed he was an 80-year-old man trying to trick her into meeting. Eventually though, after some phone calls and emails, Arno visited Athens, and he kept returning until he finally moved there when they were married. It was a time in my life that I had to choose to be illegal in Greece or go illegally to Netherlands or uh, be deported back in Iran and die. <laughs> and uh, so I prayed and I said, God, I don't want to have those three choices. I have no other. I want a better choice. And, uh, and when I prayed, I clearly could hear him say in my heart that I am closing the doors because I know the first thing that happens is that you're going to jump on that plane and going to leave Greece. And I said, uh, God, if you want me to stay in Athens, I'll stay, just make me legal. Miraculously, 24 hours later, I had my Dutch resident permit in my hands. And uh, not only I had a Dutch resident permit, I had it free of charge in my hands. And passed the court, got the visa, I was at the embassy and I could declare that the Greek government and so I knew clearly that I had to stay. So I went to Arno and I told him, I have a problem. I promise God I'm staying. <laughs> and he said, I'm glad you got to that point because I did promise him a few months ago, but I knew how, how much you hated this country and you wanted to go. <laughs> so I didn't tell you. Today, Arno and Sahar work in tandem. Arno had no intention of being a bivocational pastor. He was just leading a Bible study with Sahar that turned into a large group 
that turned into a gathering that met every Sunday. Yeah, of course, we, we meet, uh, meet on Sunday, yeah. but we also meet during the weeks. Uh, we have uh, discipleship uh, lessons. Um, we meet in each other's homes also for just for, for, for fun and, and fellowship. Uh, we are, we're kind of a family together, and we try to be a family. We have Afghan people, we have Iranians, of course, uh, quite a few, and we have some from foreigners who are with us. I'm from Holland, we have uh, somebody from Albania, from America, from the UK, um, from Czech. God is amazing, and I, I never ever dreamed that I would be used in such a way in, uh, as part of God's plan. And I know I don't deserve any of it, and I don't deserve the privilege of, of, of being part of this, but He still chooses to, to, uh, to include me in it, so I'm just grateful. The church is family led by a husband and wife team who speak to each other in Dutch, Farsi, and English. On Sundays, Arno begins his sermon by asking people what he spoke on the previous week, and at the end, he leaves a time for questions. Everyone is a new believer. Everything is new. But the questions are old, similar to the Gentile churches of the first century. Can we drink? Can we smoke marijuana? What is sexually permissible? How should we pray? What is sin? What does it mean to tell the truth? Many of those who attend church help Sahar with medical ministry. She became involved in medical ministry when she was hospitalized during her first pregnancy. Bored with lying down all day, she offered to translate for doctors in the hospital and became God's ambassador from the hospital bed. Today, she is hosting a clinic. Most of the church members are here helping as well. One of the doctors is from Germany, and she has been sharing the gospel with him all week. He's close. God gave me compassion for the sick and people who don't have a good healthcare system. So I have managed to make a, a network of local doctors and also doctors from outside of Greece who are willing to offer their time for free and I translate and coordinate with patients and uh, we fundraise to be able to do lab work and uh, do follow up for them, buy the medications and this is the way we can help them in health situation and at the same time we can help them to heal spiritually and tell them about Jesus. The great doctor who can actually help them to be healed and heal their soul as well. How many Muslims today would pen the same words as the Emperor Julian, writing in the 4th century? The Christian faith has been specifically advanced through the loving service rendered to strangers. The godless Galileans care not only for their own poor, but ours as well, while those who belong to us look in vain for the help that we should render them. Victoria Park. Well, it's not really a park. It was at the center of the crisis in 2015 and 16. During this time, Sahar would walk around shouting in Greek and English and Farsi, Doctors! Anybody want doctors? When migrants arrived in the port of Athens, some hopped on the green metro line and rode it here. In 2016, Thousands of people were staying in tents, waiting for wire transfers or rides. The conditions were horrible. So much so that two men hanged themselves from a tree in despair. At one point, over 200 buses waited at the park to transfer migrants to the border. Greek taxi drivers responded by blocking the roads, demanding that they be allowed to transport migrants as well there is a lot of money to be made off of desperate people. Christians were here too, with food and doctors. But today, the herald of good news is not here with medicine, but a backgammon board. Like they have done many times before to so many others, 
the heralds have first invited us to their home. David and Ruth Marino, one of the youngest, most effective, and faithful missionary couples I know. I met David a few years ago and found my definition of a missionary crumbling. He had just turned 22 and moved to Athens after watching the United States bomb ISIS on the border of Turkey. David and Ruth have hosted many migrants in their home. They recently had a party for a group of squatters from a condemned Greek building. I'm reminded of the bishop of Victor Hugo's novel Les Mis. As a stranger is welcomed into the bishop's home, he tells the stranger, this house is not mine but Christ's. It does not ask a man his name or whether he is in need. You are in trouble. You are hungry and thirsty. And so you are welcome. You need not thank me for receiving you in my house. No one is at home here except those seeking shelter. Let me assure you that this is more your home than mine. Everything in it is yours. Discipleship with new believers is common. Hospitality is not a burden, but a privilege. So I came to Greece when I was 22 years old to be a full-time missionary. And before that, I'd been praying and I had a heart to reach Muslims, and not just Muslims, people who were unreached and have no access to the gospel. They never heard about Jesus, they had never met a Christian, they'd never seen the Bible, and they're growing up in Islamic dominated countries where um, to, to be a Christian would cost them their life, their families, imprisonment, and, and they can't even think about the idea of becoming a Christian. That didn't sit well with me. I was sleepless nights thinking about this, kept me up, praying, God opened a door for me to come and serve His people. And um, sure enough, I was able to come to Greece where there have been thousands upon thousands of migrants flowing in through Athens and living here. The first person that David shared the gospel with in Greece was a fanatic Muslim. David visited his apartment with a friend and listened to the man berate him, airing all his grievances. But then a surprise. Unbeknownst to this Muslim, David had been on his hands and knees cleaning this man's bathroom over the last few weeks. The friend of David began telling the Muslim that David had been cleaning this man's toilet. Immediately, a change. How could it be that an American and a Christian would stoop so low as to clean his toilet? He immediately became open to the gospel. Multiple times a week, David heads to Victoria Park. He puts a cross around his neck to help start conversations. In his bag is a Bible and a backgammon board. And so off to Victoria Park we went, in search of backgammon players. At Victoria, migrants are milling around. Some have nothing to do but wait. Greek men walk around, propositioning young Afghan boys for sexual favors. But how beautiful are the feet who bring good news to this place. There is David, this Farsi-speaking American with a cross around his neck and a backgammon board. And like a high-powered magnet, young men come. I try to be organic in my ministry, and the way I can do that is just by doing relational things like board games, and Middle Easterns love backgammon, and uh, I've come to love it myself, and um, I'm doing really good, actually. I'm beating everybody now. And so I go to the park, and uh, I play with the people, and, and while I'm there, you know, sometimes crowds, people get around, sometimes nobody comes, sometimes one person comes. And uh, just last week, I was playing backgammon with a guy named Bashir. He's an Afghan, and he fought with the U.S. against the Taliban. And uh, through playing that game, I was able to start sharing the gospel with him. And now he's writing every single day because we're friends and he wants to see what's going on. Reza, whom David led to Christ and discipled, is with him sharing the gospel. Reza heard the gospel for the first time on his way to Greece. Like many others, it was the love of Christians that opened the door. David was just one in a line of many other gospel workers along the way coordinated by the Holy Spirit to draw Reza to Christ. While in Turkey, Reza and his wife met an Iranian boy who helped them with their lodging. Having no shoes, Reza and his wife gave their extra pair to the boy. They crossed to Greece by boat and registered at a camp, soaking wet. They were still with the young boy, and that night he hung up the shoes to dry. 
but Reza stole them back. He just wanted them. The young man was barefoot again, but that was not Reza's problem. I took the shoes and hid them. The next day, a Christian group came and had food outside the camp. It was very cold and the boy went out to get the food. But he was barefoot and could not go. I was watching when one of the Christians saw him, untied their own shoes and gave them to the boy. I watched him and my heart was touched. And that moment was the first time I saw Christian love. They came to Athens and got a ticket to the Macedonian border by bribing the bus driver, but they were turned back multiple times. One of those times, a Korean short-term team handed them a Bible. Reza just tossed the Bible to his wife and told her to read it and tell him what it was about. They ended up in Athens after multiple attempts when another Christian group shared food, shelter, and the gospel with them. Reza was saved. The love of Christians, a Bible from a Korean short-term team, the love of Christ in the midst of a terrible situation. Now, he is returning to Iran to pastor those he has led to Christ over Skype. I have reached relatives and friends with the gospel and started discipling them. And 15 people have converted and believed in Jesus and given their heart to him. We prayed a lot that God would open a door to minister in Iran. And I am moving back there to help the church we have planted. I am so happy. David, Ruth, and Reza are part of a church plant, a multicultural church led by Greeks. It is one of the first church plants by Greek evangelicals in the past 100 years. The man behind the vision is Pastor Yotis, the pastor of First Church, the oldest Protestant church in Athens. To meet him, I must ascend to his office up three flights of stairs, where I am warmly greeted. Hey, hey. I to see you too. Yeah. Located directly below the Parthenon, First Church boasts the world's best view from a pastor's office. Across the street, remnants of Zeus's temple, a reminder of the fate of the gods made by human hands. Yotis is the man who originally shared the gospel with Sahar 18 years ago. When I first heard of him, people told me he was the Tim Keller of Greece. Most people just call him Yotis. I am honored to be his friend. One of the things that we came to realize is that the best way to really minister to the refugees is through local communities of believers, through local churches that we are willing and ready to uh, in, be involved and uh, be there. So one of the things that uh, it was very interesting was this, that the two churches that we planted, one in Glyphada and the other in Exarchia, even geographically, they were at the very place where most of the refugee action took place. I know there are many different narratives as to how to interpret and say the story of the refugee crisis. But for me, when I think that uh, the 1040 window uh, in a way is emptied to Europe, I cannot avoid the implication and I, I see God in it. So I cannot simply say this is politics, this is the war, this is something. Uh, having hosting, actually, we host uh, every Friday an evangelistic meeting in our church, and we have 150, 200 people attending, and uh, Muslims, all of them, and they give their kids, 40, 50 kids, to, to Sunday school. And, I mean, these are things that they were unheard of in the past, and all these things are just happening. I mean, what kind of view of God you have to think that this is just a coincidence. I believe in the sovereignty of God and I, I do believe that this is God's doing and I want to be part of it. Yotis is a man with a mission. Tim and Alex are the church planters, mentored and commissioned to go out from First Church. Exarchia, 
the anarchy capital of Europe, and the home of great street art. No Home for the Poor is a reminder of what is on the mind of those who live in this neighborhood. The police have no power here, and they stay on the border. There is an invisible fence around this neighborhood, and everyone knows where it is. There is a saying here, you don't live in Exarchia, they choose you to live here. Tim and Alex are refugee stock. Tim's mom is Greek and his father is Sri Lankan. He was raised in the UK. Tim and Alex's grandparents were refugees in the 1920s when they were expelled from Turkey. The mission of a church it is to be an evangelistic outreach in community uh, within this uh, area. We spend time with the people by honestly loving them, you know, healing them. Let them change us, you know, so it's not just one way. You know, there's so many times that we say we found the right theology in the wrong lips, if I can say. And somehow it is a reminder of the gospel back to us. So this uh, daily, uh, um, you know, exchanging, uh, sharing life together, if I can say, it has changed everything. It has opened up our house. Um, it has uh, made uh, the church, you know, uh, look like a family. The right theology on the wrong lips. Sometimes the world preaches truth to the church. A refugee and immigrant neighborhood that most people avoid, Tim and Alex call home. Their mission? To make disciples. The primary mission of the church is to do evangelism and discipleship. But at the same time, if the outworking of the gospel uh, is uh, one aspect of that is um, justice and mercy, um, and that that's an essential element of the gospel, um, then we want to see our church members uh, being actively involved in mercy ministries, like the integration house that we have uh, downstairs. Have you ever heard of apartments in a church where Muslim families reside and are integrated into the community of faith and provided help? The integration house includes apartments where the church meets. Justice ministry feeds back into gospel ministry. This is not a program. This is who they are. The house belongs to God and the guest. Isn't it a little bit weird to have this fear of welcoming refugees when we do have a mission in our churches? We do have, uh, we, we are okay to say we will send missionaries, you know, to a country. Uh, no matter, you know, if they're going to be persecuted, you know, they're going to be full of fear, they may be exposed to death, you know, and so many difficult things. Is it that inconsistent by saying, you know, we, we don't allow mission to happen here? The church not only hosts an integration house, it also oversees an NGO. So in 2014, we were approached by a young lady called Patricia, who is from Denmark, and she had been doing her uh, master's research on the issue of the un unaccompanied minors who were coming to Greece, and there were over 3,000 um, minors back then. This was before the refugee crisis, the big wave, and they were essentially invisible. And uh, as she told us about their plight, and um, she had plans to start up kind of like an NGO, a Greek NGO. And at the time, we were thinking through about how to be involved in some kind of uh, mercy ministry, not just for the sake of it, but trying to meet a real need. And that just came uh, together in a, at exactly the right time. We were months old as a church. So we accepted her uh, proposal to start up a Greek NGO together. Tim takes us for a visit to Pharos, their NGO near Victoria Park. Outside the center, Greek men wait for the young boys, offering to pay them for sex. Like the sodomites of old who wished to mistreat travelers, they wait outside the house targeting the boys for rape. Many of these miners have been living on the streets, prostituting themselves to make money. But inside, sanctuary. About 50 children come each day for food and classes. There is a sleeping area as well, beds for 22. And like most boys' rooms, the socks are left out. These boys are alone because either families have died along the journey or they were sent ahead by themselves. They are as young as 10 and as old as 18. Those who age out have nowhere to go. 
It is here where we meet Dan, who with his wife started Pharos. It's one of the stories that came to my mind in a different way than before. Um, and it's the, the parable of, of the Good Samaritan. And it, was, it is a parable that I have heard uh, throughout my life. But I remember around, um, around 2015, and, and I read it again, but, but kind of in a new light. Um, I think I've, you, know, you maybe always see yourself when you're doing uh, mercy work, or, or um, it, it's easy to, to see yourself as, as perhaps the Good Samaritan. <laughs> um, but at some point, that, that story twisted a little bit in, in my understanding. Um, and that it was at the same time that we opened our, our shelter for the unaccompanied minors. Um, and seeing the boys that were brought by the Good Samaritan to the shelter. And kind of I saw my role, our role, um, being the innkeeper, being the person that provides the hospitality for them. Uh, my job is not to be the Good Samaritan. My, my job is not to, uh, to save the world. There's somebody else who has done that. <laughs> And that's not me. Uh, but my task is to receive uh, whoever is put on my doorstep and welcome them and love them uh, with all I can. So I think we can be that innkeeper uh, wherever we are, if it's in Greece, if it's in Germany, if it's in the United States, uh, seeing the people that, that are placed before us, uh, no matter who they are, but seeing that they have been entrusted to us for a shorter time or a longer time. Innkeepers, taking in children with nowhere else to go, this inn is always full. Today, there are 45 innkeepers working, many of them at the family center run by Feroz. Many Muslim families come, often just for a safe place to be. The schedule includes English and Greek classes, legal help, and showers, a small yet meaningful thing, the ability to be clean, and a familiar face, Ruth Marino. I don't know, I look at them and I feel like they could be my family. That lady sitting there could be my, uh, my aunt or my mom, my sister. So I just feel, I don't know, I just love them. The young girls are learning new skills. Photography, art, music, things forbidden back at home. Ruth has listened. Her views have changed. My idea about illegal immigration has changed a lot uh, since I've been here. In the beginning, um, especially about how they would use a smuggler to move on to a different country, I was very much against that and uh, everyone I spoke to, every woman I spoke to, I would, I would tell her, like, don't do it, it's illegal and I was very much against it but after hearing um, their stories, like I work with a social worker and a legal advisor, I know how the situation in Greece and how difficult it is for them and how it would be for them in a different country. So now I, I don't get involved and I don't, I don't tell them what I think they should do in that sense because I don't understand, I don't know what they're going through, I don't know what it's like to live in a camp uh, full of men and you have a little girl that you're taking care of. I don't know what it's like to be in that position, so I can't talk. How do you talk about immigration with exploited people? These girls are political symbols to some, destroyers of cultures to others. But for Ruth, they are just the people in front of her, exploited, beaten down, persecuted, and in need of the gospel. This is life for one church family in the anarchy capital of Europe, a light in darkness. There is another church plant of First Church in Glyfada, a wealthy suburb south of Athens. George Tolios is the pastor. Greece is less than 1% evangelical, so First Church's original plan was to reach out to Greeks in the area. But things changed when the old airport down the road was converted into a large refugee camp. George takes us to the apartment complex that the church owns that is three floors with five apartments on each level. Ten apartments have been renovated. There are four families here right now, and more will be able to come as the church raises money to continue renovations. It is here where the church expresses hospitality. So uh, tell me about these... Uh, Back at church, there are pictures of refugee so, uh, families who now live in church apartments. One refugee criticized his government, and as a result, they tried to kill him. 
Another fled war. Some just wanted a better life. They are all Muslim, except for one, a woman who bears the mark of Christ on her body by the hands of the government. Uh, yeah, like this guy uh, came eight months ago and um, he w started to see the hospitality of the church. That, it was very strange for him. I, I didn't realize that God was working in his heart. After four or five months, he came here in a Bible study Wednesday night. And in this Bible study, uh, you know that Wednesday night, they are the traditional uh, Presbyterian evangelical, the, the, the people that they were trying to keep a distance from refugees, even in our church, like because at the beginning, refugees, I must admit that it, they were not welcomed. So he came here in this Bible study with all the conservatives and uh, asked the permission to say something. And everybody stopped talking and we all turned our faces to this guy here. And he said, like I'm here uh, all this month, I hear about Christ, I see your love and I feel like right now is the time for me to ask uh, your uh, permission to come in your church uh, and, you know, to, to be a Christian. I want to be part of your community. And all these people that they were he hesitant to receive refugees started to cry because they could see that for all this month we served this guy. And, you know, that, that was a night that I will never forget in my life. George called it a crisis of their own hearts that God addressed by bringing refugees. The topic of entertaining strangers and thereby welcoming God is not always seen in evangelistic strategy. But today, rich and poor, refugee and Greek citizen, all worship together. This is a church willing to integrate with refugees, transformed from fear to love, not marking people off as outsiders, welcoming strangers. In a car that you cannot uh, communicate with others. Yeah. Do they yeah. talk or do they Today we are riding with Mihales, a gifted Greek church planner working with AMG yeah. International. A few years ago, he began praying about planting a church in the town of Lavrion. One month later, Lavrion Refugee Camp opened. Athens is about an hour drive from uh, this uh, refugee camp. There is no public transportation. There is only one uh, private bus company that uh, the, the ticket costs uh, like seven dollars. Uh, uh, each person one direction. So can you imagine a family of ten uh, going down to Athens for the asylum service, they will have to pay $70 just to get there. So this is an impossible case. And uh, we stepped in and we started to uh, serve the refugees by just transferring down to Athens. While we were doing it, we realized that God was giving us uh, an amazing opportunity. We had one hour of private time with nobody else listening, people would uh, feel comfortable to share with us, to ask questions, and we also had the opportunity to share about our faith and why we're doing what we're doing. One day, I had to take some refugees down to the dentist, a young man from Afghanistan who was the leader of the community. He asked me, I have heard Christians say that Jesus died for our sins, but I don't understand this. Can you please explain? I had the, the opportunity to share the gospel with him. Two or three days later, I see him uh, at the camp, at the refugee camp, and he comes and he makes another question. He says, I have always had another question. If Jesus is who you say he is, and if Christianity is the truth, why haven't we ever seen any Christians come to Afghanistan and share the gospel with, with us, and share the truth with us? And I was trying to figure out the right answer, but he went on and he said, after I met you, I, I know the answer. 
it was impossible for Christians to come to Afghanistan. So God took us out of our country and brought us here in Greece to hear about Jesus. The Apostle Paul's words ring true. God did this so that they would seek Him and perhaps reach out for Him and find Him. Today is like many others. Mahales is driving to Lavrion to pick up refugees. On our way, we stop at another camp. This one is not sanctioned by the government. There is no assistance offered to these people. The camp is full of Kurds and is located in the middle of a dump. Mihalis is there to help. Today, he is getting the list of materials needed to build a gathering area. If refugees are marginalized people, the Kurds are even more so. We continue on the Lavrion, one of the nicer and more organized camps. It's run by the Greek Navy. People are waiting to be picked up. But we are here to meet one man who has been impacted by Mihalis' ministry. He is here to greet us and show us his stash of Bibles that he passes out. This is the home of a refugee. And though worse than poor, he gladly welcomes us into his home. He had an accident and he fell from the second floor. He broke his arm and his leg. So he had to go to the hospital very often, every week or every other week, to get his x-rays and exams and stuff. Uh, so we spent a lot of time with him in the car. Uh, and little by little he started to open up and have questions about uh, God and faith and Christianity. Eventually, because of those rights, he became a Christian. And uh, he actually became a very outspoken Christian. He lived in the refugee camp and uh, every week he would come and ask, ask me for New Testaments in Arabic. And uh, he would take them and uh, distribute them in the uh, refugee camp. And you know, I, I cannot just walk into a refugee camp and distribute New Testaments, uh, but he can. And uh, he, he was doing it. And he was growing in his faith. And one Sunday night after our service, he came and he said, I want to get baptized. I said, that's fine. We will do it. We will do it soon. But I want you to, to pray and finish your discipleship program. Uh, and then we will do it. That was Sunday night. On Friday night, uh, during the night, around 2 o'clock in the night, he got an attack. Uh, somebody broke into his house. Uh, and uh, they had a fight. and. One of the reasons was that, because, that he became a Christian. This uh, young man, he's strong, he survived the fight. Uh, uh, and uh, the next day I, I went to the refugee camp and I took him out and took him to a safe place. Uh, he spent the night there, but when he woke up, he said, I want to go back to the camp because I'm not afraid and uh, because what is this guy going to think about my God if I just run away? Uh, and he says, even if something wrong happens to me, I know that I have made the right decision. Uh, so when am I getting baptized? <laughs> the baptistry is back at AMG headquarters. It's a water fountain, a nice piece of landscaping. But with so many people turning to faith in Christ, Mihalis began using it for baptisms, hundreds of them. You can see the step they built to help people enter. From here people announce new life, buried with Christ, born again to new life. We ride along as Mihalis transports migrants to Homespot, a center run by AMG. It is quiet because language is a barrier. But there is free Wi-Fi in the van, and everyone is checking Facebook, watching YouTube videos, or sending messages to friends. When we arrive, the refugees enter the building. They can watch TV or sew. They can hang out. Families have a space to sit together comfortably. Outside, 
A Greek woman comes by offering a generous wage to anyone who wants to complete some work for her. But inside of Homespot, other things are happening too. Mihalis entered refugee ministry because of his passion for church planting. There is a Greek Bible study and church plant meeting here. On Sunday mornings, an Arabic-speaking church meets. And just recently, an English-speaking Bible study was added. They also have started a second Arabic-speaking church in Athens. There is a lot going on. All started because Mihalis organized car rides. The impact on Mihalis and his family has been enormous. God took away all our fears and the prejudice that we had. And we started literally living with those people. Uh, we would invite them in our homes and we would go and visit them at their place just to realize that they are people uh, and they need love, uh, respect as everybody else. And there's nothing to fear about. And I take my family there in the refugee camp. I, we visit families in the refugee camp when we have um, uh, lunch, coffee with them. And uh, the last time I was there with my kids, uh, my, my kids were playing with uh, this little guy, Mohammed. And uh, on our way back, uh, my daughter told me something that uh, I will never forget. And it was the highlight for me as a father. She told me, Daddy, can we please invite Mohammed to my birthday? And I realized that God was changing her world. And I, I realized that uh, my daughter had uh, understood the real meaning of the gospel better than myself. So I encourage people to open their hearts and their lives for those that God is bringing in our doorsteps. How do you determine where God has called you? Miriam is from Eastern Europe, single, and served in Central Asia until she was unable to return for safety reasons. God forced her to Athens, and it only took a day to realize why. On the first day she was in Athens, she came to a ministry center as she was trying to decide if God wanted her to be here. As she walked into the large meeting room, a church service was happening. And there, at the mic leading the service, was a believer who attended the underground church in Central Asia where she used to work. He had been a strict Muslim who had become a Christian. She had no idea he had migrated to Greece. But then a greater surprise. When they were in Central Asia together, this man would always ask for prayer for his wife to become a believer. And now, there she was, on stage with him. She had become a Christian in Athens. The timing of God is perfect. Miriam now works for Hellenic Ministries, which was founded by Kostas Makris, the first modern Greek Protestant missionary who served amongst cannibalistic tribes in Irian Jaya before returning home. This is the Mercy Ministry Center. When people come and we share a meal, usually I approach a family. Uh, they were um, a family with uh, three children and she was uh, very pregnant. They um, looked very lost looking around, so I thought this is, might be their first time. And I approached them and spoke to them. They were very shocked that I'm a white girl uh, speaking their language. And uh, I just asked them, how are you? And uh, are you? Did you come new here? Is this your first time? And, uh, and they all leaned in as they were trying to tell me their story of how um, they left uh, Central Asia and how tired they are of the war and the violence and uh, that they decided as a family to, to, to dedicate their lives to Christ and to find Christ and become believers. 
Something as simple as asking someone how they are doing makes a life-changing difference. Not processing them, not judging the veracity of their story, just practicing common, or maybe uncommon, kindness. Tonight is no different. Miriam is sitting with a family from the same city and country where she used to serve. They ask a simple question. Is it possible to have one of the plastic containers? They're asking for the container that is used to collect dirty dishes. The family was living in an abandoned school in the basement and didn't have anything in which to bathe their baby. They had been traveling for two and a half years and had just arrived in Athens. Displacement often creates indignity among those traveling and fears in those who meet them. It is probably typical to be afraid of what and who we don't know. Once you take a step and you encounter them and you hear their stories and you hear their needs, it is very difficult not to love them, very, very difficult not to feel compassion, although it's a complex issue. I think for believers it has to be a kingdom issue first and then all the rest. So um, we don't have to limit our command to love, but especially emphasize it with people who need it most. And sometimes it's just approaching somebody and asking how you are and listening. God often chooses to turn up in unrecognizable ways in order to confront our fears. Matt is another one so, who heeded the call uh, to go. He is a friend and an Oki uh, from Muskogee. I think we're in the best place in the world to reach Muslims for Jesus. There's not a greater place. We are a, a, a transit country. People are passing through like crazy and they're on shaky ground and they're looking for hope and peace and life and love and security. All these things we ultimately find in Christ. And so uh, to not just speak the message, but to be the message as community here, um, I don't think there's a greater thing we could do with our lives. Matt leads the team here. He remembers his first Bible study in Athens. 18 men from North Africa, all Muslims. Matt had no training, no experience. I remember thinking, if I share the gospel with these guys, are they going to attack me? And so <laughs> we didn't study the Bible. We just had a discussion. <laughs> and then we got into, at the very end, I read uh, the Gospel of John chapter 1, and I prayed. That was our Bible study. I had no idea what I was doing. And we formed some great relationships. And they became my teachers of their culture, of their religion. And um, I learned that through every conversation, there was a, a road of the gospel straight to their heart. So Matt has now been here for more than 10 years. One of the men serving alongside him is Masood. As 300 Middle Easterners eat a meal, served by Greek, Western, and Asian believers, Masood walks around and shares the gospel. Four years ago, he sat at these very tables, a defender of the Quran. He would come to Bible studies to stop other Muslims from converting. But today, he is the pastor of a church primarily made up of Afghans. I've known him for years, and he is the embodiment of Paul's words. The Lord's servant must be kind to everyone, able to teach, not resentful. He has been a refugee since he was a teenager. When I was uh, 14 years old, my father actually forced to leave Afghanistan and we went to Pakistan. Uh, through the Pakistan, we went to Iran and uh, we lived there for many years. So uh, we, we get married in Iran. Uh, my daughter, Nushin, uh, she born in Iran. So uh, because of situation in Iran for Afghans, it was very difficult. Uh, I think it still is difficult for Afghans and we live there as a slave and we could even register a SIM card of, uh, you know, uh, local number uh, in our name. So my, my daughter, she couldn't go to the school. So we decided to come to Europe to searching a better life, to searching a good opportunity for our children. So we crossed the border uh, between Iran and Turkey. And uh, uh, we lose our money because of smugglers or stole our money. 
One time they, they uh, kidnapped us and they asked for $3,000. Uh, so we had very difficult time in Turkey and we, lo we lost a lot of money. The journey by boat was dangerous. 50 people crossed with Masood, his wife, his daughter, and his 45-day-old baby boy. It was February and cold. When they got to the Greek island, there was nowhere to get off, and the boat capsized. Masood got his daughter to shore and handed the baby to her. He then went back to get his wife. And after he pulled her out of the water, he came back to his daughter. The baby was gone. I just see some white things on the water. I jump on the water and I find uh, the baby in a rope uh, in a white uh, blanket. I took her, him out and we find him. Uh, he was dark. He couldn't, you know, breathe. But I still try to help him. I was broken. And in that time, I, I just fell down and I asked to the Lord, please help me. I need you right now. I didn't know Jesus in that time. But I was believed God can help me in, in this moment. So I don't know how long it takes time, but after a little while, we find him to just react some, uh, showing something that he is still alive. So uh, it was a miracle that uh, happened to us and uh, still we have uh, this son alive. With their son saved, they arrived in Athens. No money and no way to feed their children. And so they came to Hellenic and for the first time met a Christian. I heard about, uh, about Christian people. They are false people. They're not good people. Uh, they're terrible. But when I saw them, they, they have good behavior. They love and they're sharing food. And for first time, I, I hear someone preaching the gospel. In August 2014, God saved Masood and he was baptized. When he told his brother in Germany, his brother told him, you have brought great shame on our family. His wife was not thrilled either. Her words were sobering. We escaped war in Afghanistan. We almost died in Turkey. The smugglers almost killed us. But you kill us because you got baptized. It would have been better if we had died in the sea. I was not happy Masood became a Christian. I told him, you become pagan. It was very hard. He would wake up and pray. He studied and listened to the Bible on audio. Then I became interested in the Bible when I heard it. Masood changed and started loving me. He cared for me more. Our marriage changed. This led me to believe in Jesus Christ and know Him. I have been delivered from darkness. Today, they are a Christian family. Their daughter even leads worship with them. They have been radically changed. There are very few Afghan churches in the world, but today I get to visit one. So this Masood is, uh, is happy to uh, show me around to the different Agatha ministries. Church. A it's secret Bible study, uh, discipleship uh, training, have, uh, a women's Bible study. The morning we arrive, the leaders are meeting. They call themselves the Servants Bible Study. Their vision is simple, to reach Afghanistan with the Word of God and bring salvation to their country. Upstairs are Bibles in Farsi. Masood is still in awe of how easy it is to get a Bible here. They have a small library of Christian books as well, and a place to sit and study while drinking coffee or tea. Farther up, a kitchen and eating area. The gospel and food go together.
They actually had to stop having food on Sundays because too many people came and there was not enough room for everyone. The meals were moved to Tuesdays for the seekers and discipleship groups. And in the basement, bedrooms. We have basement here. The believers who become Christian, the Muslim, you know, Muslims are half authority in the camps. They are not saying no one allowed to become Christian. If you become Christian, you cannot stay among us. So they kick him, kick them out, and they cannot live there. They cannot take food there. It is painful situation for believers in the camps. So uh, we need to provide somehow somewhere to stay. They really need shelters to you know to have brothers together and have Bible study. So that's why we have uh, this kind of uh, facility to help them and uh, help them. The cost of being a Christian can be quite high. Converts are kicked out of food lines and camps. Women, including some teens, have been raped. One man was killed. Others have gone to the UN for asylum purposes. And when the Muslim translator realized that they were Christians, he told the UN workers not to grant them asylum because they were terrorists. Today, the servants are meeting for Bible study. Their stories are all similar. They found Christ on their journey. Despite having to leave their home, their future destination is secure. Hadi is one of those servants and a friend. He is like many others. He translates, he teaches, and he is one of the most effective evangelists I know. Uh, I was a strong Muslim, and now what I do, I, uh, I proclaim the truth of Jesus uh, to the uh, Muslim people. I'm uh, sharing the gospel and discipling, and uh, I have a plan in future. Uh, I want to go to Afghanistan and Iran uh, to share the gospel with those people. Afghanistan and Iran are in his future. But today, one of those places he serves is at Oasis, where Afghans and Iranians come for a meal and help. Oasis, a place in a desert where water is found. It is hard to find Oasis, with a small sign being the only visible marker. This is a refugee center. The curtains are drawn so no one can look in. Close by, there is a beautiful Greek Orthodox church that is always empty. But here, Christians are serving. Three days a week, migrants from Iran and Afghanistan are here for a familiar meal. Tea is served, followed by a meal prepared by an Iranian. There are many mothers with their children. Most are widows with no options because their husbands were killed in war. Their homes, their farmlands, destroyed. Others have husbands who abandon them after forcing them to pay the smugglers with their bodies. When the husbands reached Europe, they took other wives. Conversations are happening over meals. Hospitality to strangers. The actions say, be warm and well fed. William is the director of Oasis. This is not his real name, but he doesn't want to be identified as a Tennessee Vols fan. I don't blame him. Uh, the goal of those conversations really is to get into a person's life just like you would in a natural context of a home uh, over a meal to be able to talk, uh, to get to know them, to hear their life circumstances, and to be able to share elements of truth um, through those interactions, to be able to pray for them and to be able to just engage them with um, who we are as believers and who uh, God is and the truth of His scriptures. William and others have discipled a number of Iranian and Afghan converts who are now co-laborers and serve as the front lines of the relationships here. It is the heart of William's strategy to train up leaders to disciple others. He has heard the taunts, 
William is a friend to Muslims. Hadi is here. He has been sharing the gospel with the people at the tables, helping to answer their questions. There is another leader here as well, my friend Javad, a humble and bold servant. Javad exudes warmth and kindness. When you are with him, you are his friend and someone he cares about. Javad was born to a Muslim family in Iran. Fifteen years ago, he was watching satellite TV when the remote fell on the floor and changed the station to a pirated Christian channel. It was the first time he heard about Jesus. A few years later, he left Iran and came to Athens, where he met Christians who shared the gospel with him. What drew him? Actually, Jesus is the reason. Sometimes people are looking for, you know, different things, but I think Jesus is, you know, when I read the gospel and hear about the lo his love and love of God, because as a Muslim, I know God is love. I, I, I knew, like, God loving, but I didn't know God completely is love. And when I look at the Bible, and, you know, in my hand, and I saw that changed my heart because I knew what to talk about it. God is love. When I get here like Christian, the people who know God love me and, you know, hug me as a, like first time when I meet, you know, one of the pastors, he hugged me like my father, my father, you know, like he knows me like a long, long time like that. And that's, you know, touch my heart. It's something different. The love, completely different love because they, uh, they got the love of God and they, this, this light in them, this Jesus in them, showing to other people, and that's it. This is the impact of those who heeded the words of Jesus. Let your light shine before others so that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Javad is a man who has discipled and led thousands of Iranians to Christ. Nearly all of them have left Athens. He recently got a call from someone he shared the gospel with five years ago. Now in Germany, the family was calling to tell him they wanted to become Christians. Another man Javad led to Christ and discipled moved to the Netherlands a year ago. They lost touch. But just this week he called Javad. He had led 300 people to Christ and was asking Javad to come and help him. They desperately needed a teacher. Today, he is sharing the gospel, providing advice, helping people with medical questions and more. He takes me outside to tell me one story in particular that happened at the entrance of Oasis. There was an elderly Afghan woman who ended up in Athens alone. Her children were still in her home country. Each week, she would come to Oasis, clearly overwhelmed with the troubles in her world. Javad had prayed with her many times and explained that the answer to her troubles was Jesus. Like many Afghans, she was not interested in the gospel. One day Javad asked her, if God reveals himself to you and shows you the truth, will you follow him? She just laughed. A few weeks later, she met Jesus. On that day, she walked by Oasis, but no one was there, and the doors were closed. So she sat down the rest outside of the door. Suddenly, she saw a bright light coming from behind her. So bright, she covered her eyes. The light was shining brighter than the sun. In front of her, she saw a big shadow, and then a voice speaking to her in her own language. My daughter, my daughter, the door is open to you. Come. She replied, the door is closed. Again, the voice said to her, I am the son of God, Jesus. The door is open for you, my daughter. I am the door. Later that day when Oasis was open, she walked in and Javad could immediately tell something was different. As she told the story, she began trembling and her heart was pounding as she proclaimed the peace and joy she had experienced since hearing Jesus speak to her. He had actually told me the story a year earlier, and when I asked him to tell it to me again, he had to try to remember. He told me, we have stories like this all the time, 
It's just hard to remember them all. There is another ministry Javad does at a secret location where he records teaching videos that he puts on social media. Nearly 10,000 people from Afghanistan, Tajikistan, Iran, and other countries watch them. People will email him questions. Mullahs from Afghanistan, families huddled around a computer learning the Bible, migrants who have left Athens. He has a sense of humor about some of the questions. Actually, many Muslims, or they contact us and the Mullah, uh, like as a question, you know, because they learn from, a, you know, when they child, childhood, they said, you know, Bible is crap. And so I decided to make a video that <laughs> it's Bible crap. Javad is now married to Julie, a red-headed Texan. When they were married, they met with an immigration lawyer who assumed they would try to get a visa for Javad to go to the U.S. No, they needed a visa so Julie could stay in Athens. After the third time, I think third or fourth time, I went, I said, so what is it? Everything is good? I said, yeah, she, you know, working. And I said, so when she can come or how we can process how it's going? And she said, what? Like, you have to go there. And I said, no, you misunderstand me. I said, no, like, she have to come here. I don't want to go there. And she said, we don't have case like that. If you want to go, I said, no, because God called me to be here. And I want she come here. <laughs> they are committed to being in Athens, and they are building a life, a family. Relationships start in the center where they serve together. They then move into homes for meals and Bible studies. And if people stay long enough, church. Where today, like many before, new believers that Javad has led to Christ are being baptized in a green tub that had been used on a Greek olive farm before finding a nobler purpose. The gospel is being proclaimed. Songs are being sung. This is a church of less than 50 that has seen thousands come to faith and go on to other churches in Europe. Every Christian here is an evangelist, in part due to the example of their pastor. As a pastor, I'm called to share in the gospel, to preach the gospel, the truth to the people. And my goal is to raise the leaders, and I'm doing and I don some leaders, and then praise the Lord and uh, to disciple the people who really want to serve the Lord. And I want, they go everywhere, like Germany, Austria, Netherlands, you know. So I want to raise the leaders or pastors to teach other people because Iran will be open and we need much, much, much pastor, more and more to go and every town, every, you know, area to share the, the gospel with the people. And so Javad teaches, and disciples, and sends out. In my experience, it is the love of God and the love of Christians that draw Muslims to Jesus Christ. It is meeting God who is near to them, who calls himself Father. And it is God's people expressing love to people who are not expecting it. takes on the persona of a traveler. Remember his words in Revelation. Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. Jesus was a refugee, cast out because of a brutal ruler, crossing borders to find safety. It was rejection something the Savior would face over and over again. Yet, he also welcomed. He fed hungry crowds. He commanded love for the hated neighbors of Samaria. He clothed the demon-possessed man. This is the Savior of God's chosen exiles. He invites the unwanted and undeserving to enter his safe and secure home. 
So God's people gathered together, live as exiles still on the move. These Christians are migrating to the new Jerusalem where they will find an eternal home prepared for them and dwell with God forever. Although today their worship is often divided by language and culture, they will one day all worship together, not in hidden rooms in a country that wants them to leave, but at the throne room of God in a land where they will find peace and security forever.